because the next speaker is not somebody, it's Mr. Jan Worm. Uh, he's, uh, w he works in uh, Berlin at, uh, uh, at Arab uh, Berlin. He's an architect with a passion for architectural engineering. He wrote a book on glass structure, was a, prof uh, a visiting professor in Denmark. Uh, sorry, I can't name the school, a Danish uh, technical university. And uh, you will give a brief introduction on uh, the issue of uh, technology and sustainability. Please, Mr. Worm. So thank you very much for the UN team, Tima Edis, to invite me. I'm very happy to be here and share some of my knowledge and experience. Um, so I'm working for Arab, which is a big engineering company. We work on different scales of projects, from the master planning to, to really sp specialist technical engineering um, in all kinds of technical disciplines. And we are active in most of the regions in the world. And with a company of 10,000 people, knowledge sharing, and the question of how you can harvest that knowledge to do something special with it is a big, is a big issue for us. Um, and, and probably my focus is on how to make it happen, how really to do a project and to make something. Now you wonder, well, you know the first bit of the lecture which was announced in the program, teaming up to push the boundaries. And now probably you wonder about the second one. What is that Ocean's Eleven principle and what does it got to do with building technology? Um, does it mean that you know, innovating in the building industry is as difficult as robbing three casinos at the same time and walking out with the money? You may say so. It's definitely, as Karina has pointed out, a very difficult and challenging process. Now, be first, I, I go into the, um, my personal view of what that principle could mean for us. Um, I want to say a couple of words uh, on myself. So I also started as an architect. Uh, I was specializing in glass construction and then did a PhD and then moved to the London office of Arab, working for the facade engineering group and the material science group. And then moving over four years ago to Berlin to build up the materials consulting group. So we already discussed questions of materials and how they can impact on innovation in the building industry. So I'm very keen and curious to, to um, have a deeper discussion later on when we go into the table. Um, and now I've taken on another responsibility of leading what we call the technology team, which are five different teams, um, all specialists. It's a lighting design team, building physics, acoustics, and fire engineering. Um, and as I said, we work on different uh, stages of projects, from, from master planning down to the uh, technical assessment. And we team up with different people within the company and outside. And I'm genuinely interested to see and to understand why some teams are successful, why they do achieve something outstanding, and why other teams fail. And they don't achieve to go to the next stage after they come up with an idea and they, they uh, agreed on the outline, they will not deliver. And there are some external boundaries which have to do with the conservative approach of the building industry, but there are some internal issues as well. Right. So, uh, Ocean Eleven. Um, well, you know. Well, some of you may, might know the. Well, who 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 knows the film? Who has seen the film? It's, it was a pretty popular film, wasn't it? 2001. It was a remake of a film from the 60s, but still, it's a Hollywood film. Um, and that's that's a scene from the um, from the original. So let's just briefly go into the film, which you probably all have seen, and go through the characters. So here we've got Danny Ocean. Um, He's the charismatic leader. Um, he's been in prison for four years. He had lots of time to think about the perfect plot. Um, and now he's released and he wants to make it happen. We are not quite sure how he got to the plot, whether it was co-inventing with his inmates in prison, but he's going out, has that plot, he needs to find the right team. He needs to get to the right network. Um, so that's the first level, but there's another one, which is that actually next to robbing the bank, or three, sorry, three casinos, so the vault underneath the casinos, 150 million cash in it, uh, walking out, um, extremely challenging, difficult task to do. 
um, there's another level, and that's his ex-girl or his ex-wife is now the girlfriend of the owner of the casino, of Terry. He's the bad man. Um, so there's a really passionate level of why he wants to make this happen. happen. It's his, his first mate. It's, it's an old friend of him. It's Frank. He's the inside man. He works for the Bellagio uh, Casino. He knows quite well what's going on there. And then a key figure is this gentleman here. It's Rusty. It's his second man. Um, and actually, he's the operational brain of the whole thing. He's, he's the project manager. He does things happen within that team. And of course, what you need, you need someone with the money. You need the founder. Um, and that's the guy. Uh, it's it's um, Reuven. And he's an old gentleman, or he's an he's a, like old uh, businessman. He's also got a little bit of thing going on with Terry, the owner of the casino. So he's got some personal interest. Um, but he's sort of the inspirational guy in the, in the background. He doesn't really go into the operation itself. He gives the money, but he's there on the scene um, while the team is operating. Now, so this is, the, let's say, direct relationships to these guys. And now you need the team of specialists to break in and get away. And here they ring at your doorbell and they come to see you. Here they are. That's your team. They're all hand-picked. They're all specialists. They're all super clever. They're not very open, let's say, to authority. They get bored very quickly. So opening the door, here you've got the guys. Um, in front, you've got the acrobat, which will play an important role of, of uh, getting into the uh, cave. You've got the IT geek here. On the left, you've got the pickpocket, and so on. So all specialists um, at your door looking at you. So what, what do you want? How do I fit in? So if you open the door and say, hey guys, you're five minutes late, that's the last time, they probably go around and go back and that's it. So um, there, is a, there is a new thing developing, I think, about teams with very clever people. Um, they, they do want authenticity, they do want a real experience, they want to be excited, they want to have fun. Uh, they're probably not very happy about a very dictatorial uh, uh, management of the whole thing. We all know that um, well, Danny is successful, they do walk out of the bank, and he gets his girl back. So what, what was happening inside the team? So what's going on in that team? Um, in the middle, probably there is, there is Danny, who is, the, who is the one who really has the passion to, um, to do this. He's, he's got a really personal interest. He's driving it. He owns it. Um, then you've got Rusty. Um, he's his manager. Very strong, close relationship. And he's got the network. He's got the network to identify the specialist, which is, again, the network is important. And you've got the funder. You've got the guy with the money that you need to have inside your team. And then, of course, you've got different specialists. He's the dynamic specialist. And you've got all the knowledge there in that team. So what, uh, what do you do to keep that team together, uh, to do the plot, to do the project, to make it happen? And that is, um, that is the purpose of the whole thing. And for them, it's the excitement of, of the challenge, doing it. It's less so the money. I mean, 10 million, 12 million per person is OK. Um, but really, they love that challenge. Um, and that purpose needs to wrap around them, and you need to agree on the purpose, uh, but that's probably not enough. How do you uh, prevent people to get outside the thing and get distracted? And I do think, from my personal uh, experience, and I'm not an academic, I haven't read all the books on social behavior and organizational behavior patterns, but I do think that the personal relationship you have and the way you manage those relationships is absolutely crucial to keep the team together, to create that trust, to really unfold the potential, which is within the, the individuals and the specialists. Right, so I give you one example um, that I worked on, which is the bio-responsive facade. It's something where we had a cycle of three years to do that step of innovation within building technology. And um, I start with the purpose. Um, 
which was the, the box around the team. Um, we all enjoy probably being outside. Um, we know how nice it is to go step outside this, go into the forest, enjoy the shading um, and the, the refreshed air um, being inside the forest. And of course, there are different central things that attract us to, to the natural environment. There is a thing about that that there's also, um, it's a natural cycle, it produces a biomass, which you can then use in a CO2 neutral way. Um, and the natural cycle itself is recyclable. It's quite an efficient way, but we haven't really found a way to integrate it into the built environment. There's lots of interest along green facades, which are mainly to do with the aesthetic qualities, also with the shading of it. But the seasonal change is, is quite slow responsive uh, to react to the requirements of a modern building skin. Um, and also, let's say, the amount of bi biomass you harvest is minimal. There is something uh, at the time we got started around the algae thing, which was already discussed widely, is can you actually cultivate algae on the facade and get any, any benefit out of it? At that point, it hasn't, hadn't been uh, looked at, at the, on a technical level. There were concepts, but no one really had made it. No one had the team together to look into it and overcome those challenges. Um, and that's the stuff you get out of it. That would be the harvested biomass from algae, which is um, uh, a fuel uh, which you can store and use um, and you turn into biogas, methane, and then generate power. So starting 2009, so now four years ago, there was a competition um, held uh, by the EBA, and the EBA was opened March that year. And uh, the theme was the Smart Material House. And there were a number of teams invited. They were all high-profile architects on the, on, the, on the international level. And our, uh, we were invited by Spitterberg, which is a, a, a young dynamic office from Graz in uh, Austria. And they put together a team of specialists that they had relationships with. And we were one of them. Um, so my team on the materials consulting, also looking across into different disciplines of building physics and facades, Boring and Grumman as an uh, expert for this project on the structural design. So how did, how did that look like? We had EBA as a client with their own set of interests. Splitterberg was one of the teams, um, and they got together their team. It was all quite centrally focused, but it's, it's a big tribute to Splitterberg that they opened up the table and said, so what are your ideas? What do you want to do? What, I what is your interest? So everyone brought up their interests that were discussed in the group. And finally, our idea of actually um, going further uh, on the, on the bioreactor uh, system, looking for synergies, implementing it into the building, uh, was the theme that was developed then together uh, um, uh, until the submission of the competition. So who is missing in that team? which is obvious, there is no, no man with money there. So, of course, there was a high aspiration of designing something really special. Um, wasn't quite clear how much money the EBA would invest in, in for that innovation, but also there was no private funder. So that guy was missing. And also, we brought in then, during the competition, we brought in a specialist, a biologist for the algae technology, someone with the knowledge that's not um, in the building industry. And while we could maintain a relationship to this guy, who is, who is a real specialist and he's an expert, he has no experience with the building industry, and the relationship to the architects was, was quite difficult. It usually went over our, um, um, across our team, and um, it proved that that would be a critical point later on. So that was the system that the algae expert had, which was quite something he used on the open field. He never thought about putting it on the building skin. He actually said that he would produce so much heat that you need to cool the system and that that's not efficient. So there is a straight um, um, benefit of using that heat within the building, storing it, managing the heat while you produce it for, for um, or storing it geothermally for, for um, other seasons. And this would be the, um, the, the first prototype where you see those bubbles, rising air bubbles, 
uh, causing turbulence in, the, in this bioreactor panel. So the green stuff is the algae. They're swimming in the water and you get those bubbles to circulate the algae in that flat container to absorb as much light as possible, as much carbon as possible. And then uh, Spitterberg developed the theme. Uh, the idea was to put these things around at the external skin, not right into the thermal skin to reduce the, the, the risk of the whole thing. Um, so here you see into that intermediate space between left, the real thermal skin and the, the external skin, which was called the, the supernature. And there were many other ideas going into the competition, uh, onto that entry. And when it was submitted in March 2010, um, that was one of the winning schemes. Um, it's quite, probably quite, it was, a, it was, was very strong in, in looking ahead and saying what, what we could do. Um, at that point, the building EBA was three years away. Um, but there was no system, there was no procurement, there was no system supplier, and there was no one with the money. So there was an interesting process after the competition to reform the team, because the team as it was had not the capabilities to deliver it. And so the focus changed completely. In the middle, of course, was then the, the investor, a private investor um, who said he would build the actual building. He wouldn't build the facade. And then our expert from the algae business, he actually became the co-investor for the facade, for, for that new technology. And suddenly, someone quite outside the team moved right into the middle of it. So the relationship we had beforehand with them was quite good. For Splitterwerk, they, they somehow got the job to, to keep the overall design, the Künstlerische um, Oberleitung. But because Otto Wolf brought all their own specialists, um, most of the other guys were kicked out. And the only reason why we remained um, inside that box to have the possibility to initiate that innovation and to, to, to push the boundaries is well, that is actually what, what came out of the facade after the investor got on board. Is that we initiated our own collaboration, independent from the public, or from the private investor. Um, so we got together a team which consisted of, okay, the algae expert, SSC, and a secondary, and the facade contractor, Colt, who are specialized in, in secondary facade systems and also have a good track record in climate engineering. Um, and then we applied for fund for the German government, the Zukunftbau. And there was lots of um, um, talk, obviously, for these guys to, to be brave enough to give us money. And we went straight up into the ministry to convince why that could be a good idea. And of course, then there are specialists within our company, and they come from the sustainability team, from the simulation team, from the materials team, from all kinds of different backgrounds, all clever people. Um, and then uh, the external, and then SSC as, as someone from a scientist, completely different background. And, and really, the biggest thing was, was the relationships with SSC and Colt and the funder to, to keep that team together and to be clear on the purpose of it. And in that case, really, it was the innovation um, based on the idea that that will be a sustainable solution. And sustainable is a big, big theme, but I think there is probably no other purpose um, in building technology then to make a more sustainable solution. There are so many ideas around which you can take around materials, around new uh, tools, uh, which are the starting point. So this, this, this was a team, all a bit younger then, less gray hair. And this is the thing we developed is that, that panel, which was an external shading system integrating a photobioreactor for generating biomass, the algae, and also solar thermal heat, which were both taken then through the, um, through the uh, technical service plant room, uh, harvesting and going back into the building. So here you see a loop that uh, a cluster of panels is taken through the heat exchanger, um, the heat is taken out, the algae is harvested, a carbon is fed into it, and then the heat is, is pushed around the building or into the storage. These were the first prototypes. Some specialist stuff we had to do. Um, this is probably a longer story um, about the, ener um, the energy performance of the system 
and there are various things about heat and biomass. And there is a net energy gain, so much we can say, but we have now a two-year monitoring to see how big that gain is and how we can optimize it. That's the day of the opening after these three years. Um, you can see that actually the facade is an external element with some really distinct connections being able to cut away in terms it, it, it goes wrong. So there were really a lot of talk how to minimize the risk and how to get people to agree on something which you push while you didn't have a solution and to be able to plug, uh, to pull the plug in case it doesn't work. Uh, part of the um, harvesting in the energy center. And that's the, um, the panel where you can see the algae and the, and the uh, rising air bubbles. And now that building is completed. We are testing the systems. And now the big uh, thing is, of course, how do the users interact with it? What's the, um, do they accept it at all? And what do they think? So the first four parties have moved into the house and now we have a follow-up collaborative research project with the Hafen City University, which are experts in um, user acceptance and behavior patterns, interviewing the people and, and seeing how they react. Let's see um, how this will change over the heating period and the summer period. Um, but that's definitely the feedback we will get to go to the next stage. And very briefly, I thought I had 40 minutes, is that correct? Halfway, so it will be even quicker than that. Um, so now I showed you one example of at that delivery phase, how you team up and what it takes to actually deliver it. And I want to go step, uh, step back a little bit and see what me mechanisms we have in, in our company to foster innovation and knowledge transfer. This is our internet, um, co concept for our internet uh, site, which is the, pi the knowledge pyramid. Um, starting with the, with the essentials, very formalized knowledge, it's, it's approved by all the directors, um, and then it's the people and the project space, so you, you get information about every employee everywhere and about every project. And then there are the networks, which is more informal um, uh, sharing, um, so everyone can connect on a specific skills area, exchanging information in a completely open way. Um, you can just ask a question of how to do that, or do you know this person, or what's your idea? And if you post something at night, in the morning you come back, all the Australian guys have replied, and you start the day with a new set of information. And then the insights is the knowledge filtered through um, and reviewed by the skills network leaders. So this would be just the page, and you see the Arab essentials, just the, the knowledge which are, um, let's say, the base for, for our employees. That's the people's page um, where you introduce yourself. It's connected to a skills metrics, and you can search for certain skills, and then some people with their specialist skills, whether it's Basher with the explosive um, knowledge or the pickpocket specialist, or in that case, the glass expert is coming up. And so you can, uh, at the first step, um, get, get some, some first ideas of how, how, uh, who to team up with. Um, then I mentioned the forums, and that's an example. It's a facades forum. It's a very active forum. Uh, you post something. It's a bit old here. But uh, in the turn of you know, uh, two days, you get six responses from three, uh, three different regions and some other stuff. Um, and you need to have the right culture to make the best out of it. So there are these tools, but how to use them is, is one thing. Um, and you need to give a good example, I think, in, in that team, which is coming back to the element of focus in leadership, to, to focus on really the, el the things that people can help you with. Otherwise, you waste a lot of time of a lot of people. The those tools. So uh, the Facade Forum, which is a one forum out of 50, um, I think 500 people have signed up. Um, and you can sign up to different forums, of course. So the materials in the Facade Forum are, are linked. And everybody, everybody, will get everybody's question. everybody will get everyone's question. And you can, you can decide uh, actually what you want to have in your inbox. If you don't want to see all the responses, you just say, well, send me the new threads. And then if someone asks a new question which interests you, you go into the forum and you see what's happening. 
Or some people should say, oh, send me everything. So they get 30 messages a day, or uh, 40. Or if they signed up to all the forums, they just completely blow their inbox. So again, it's how you use those tools and give an example for the junior people is what you can actually get out of it. There's one really, I think, thing that, that is different about us is that we are not owned by a private person or we're not uh, on the stack, uh, stock markets. We own our own company, so it's a trust. And the profit we do, we uh, put it in one third into the bank and one third is a profit share for all our employees. And one third we, we reinvest and research is the main field of investment. And it's an open platform. So that money is given into a region and I manage the fund for the European region and every employee can come up with an idea, whether it's taken out of a project or his own interest, and he can develop the idea. And of course, he needs to see who can, what's my team. And he needs to drive it forward. Um, he needs to do some background research, which is, of course, in every case, uh, important. And often, if people fail to do that, um, you know, it's no, it's no go ahead. You need to write the application. Uh, it's an online platform. And then you need to approach people, and I always say, don't, don't write an email, pick up the phone, explain that idea to someone in the company, Con convince him, you know, show what you think is the goal and the proposal and the background, and then you will get those people sending supportive comments on that internet platform. You submit it, and then it goes to the fund managers, um, and they will assess it, and if it's an internal application, we might give between five and 15,000 euros to a team, or small team, or we um, have bigger projects which do uh, um, require external collaborators, collaborators. And we do expect those collaborators to invest as well. So we use our own funding as a leverage to collect more funding, obviously to, to increase the, 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 um, the amount of knowledge we can, we can uh, produce and share. But this is how it looks like. It's a pretty simple thing. You go in and you can just press the apply button, say what you want to do, and then you can actually see other proposals have been submitted all across the region. Um, and you can support, you can follow applications. So very, very much a web-based thing. Um, but the management of that platform obviously is a very important thing as well. Otherwise, um, it, it, does, um, it does get unfunctional in the way that you do need to say very clearly, this is what you need to do in two weeks, otherwise we will not support it. Again, the element of leadership or direction. Um, we have a reason. Can I ask a question here at this, at yes, this point? Is that okay? No, I didn't, I didn't want to ask it. Oh, sorry. sorry. But over there there was. I, I think I you felt read it. The, this gentleman's mind. Um, since uh, how you have this, pla uh, this portal or this collaboration platform, and have you ever done an evaluation of it? Um, so we have different uh, elements of our knowledge sharing platform and the internet site as I introduced in the beginning was launched um, 1999 I think. So it was one quite early on um, winning a lot of um, whatever um, prizes but the invest in Arab there was always always possibility to apply for funding and that platform has evolved and what you see now we have in place since three years but before that there was a more simple platform that uh, you uh, work in a similar way. What we do see is that getting high quality proposals is an issue. Um, and again, you really need to say what are the funding priorities? What are the goals? What is your box? Where do you want to push for new knowledge? And then get the people to sign up to it um, and get the right team. Often you don't get the right team. And often the relationships in the team, that, that's probably the background also why I tell the story about that it's not just enough to be connected. You do or have the knowledge. So network and knowledge is good. A relationship is crucial. And the management of it. And that varies, of course, through the different stages of the project. Um, and I was saying, what are those key areas? And we, we established in our current research roadmap a number, and I'm not going into detail. But business and finance, so we're looking into new ways of public-private um, uh, procurement partnerships, social impacts of procurement, um, and that's in field. We like to see what people are interested in and what, the, um, what their ideas are. 
um, estate management, so there's a big theme about asset optimization, existing buildings, improving performance financially, but also in terms of the environmental impacts and managing those portfolios and, and making them fit for a new use. Emerging technologies, of course, something I'm really keen on. Uh, it, it's, it's one theme are new materials and new technologies. Um, the other one are database related design, um, virtual design elements. Energy, um, obviously, big theme in the field of sustainability. I mean, all these things are within the context of sustainability. As I said, I think that word doesn't need a further explanation. We need to go from that word into deeper themes and see what, what, it's, what it's about. And one of them is energy, is storing, managing energy, gaining energy, the sustainable energy, the smart grids, wind power, which is a challenge in terms of um, energy infrastructure planning. Infrastructure is, yeah, assessment of critical infrastructure is new requirements for urban infrastructures. Um, and in, in the rail business is one of our biggest probably business fields, um, working directly for some governments for the master planning and to the delivery of, of, the, of the rail links and the tracks. Social behavior, uh, how do new technology interact with the user? What's the impact of the aging population? Um, and uh, the monitoring project I mentioned on the algae BIQ project is directly linked to this. What does it actually bring for the performance or the well-being of the people? Sorry for that graphics, but um, this is the last thing. Um, and we had an IPX platform, which was Intellectual Property Executive. And that was a group of people trying to harvest ideas within the company. Saying, if you have an idea for product development, let us know, we will assess it, um, and then we try to push it. It didn't work. Um, we did put a lot of money into projects. They never got very far and very few was uh, commercially successful. So we um, had an interesting uh, experience about the Hello Pad, which is a wireless charging uh, system for electromobility cars, which we did develop, and it was one individual um, on a senior level really pushing it, getting the team together, and then at that point um, having a system, a product, which was of value, and um, which actually uh, created a lot of revenue. So we changed the way we set up the harvesting of ventures or innovation, which is a brainstorming platform, um, and which is this innovation platform in the middle. And there is this guy, the techie guy on the right corner, which is the manager of that platform, do, do putting elements into that, trying to directing. It's not controlling, it's directing. It's seeing what paths can we do, uh, can we go from here. And of course there are other key people um, feeding into that platform. And then if it's successful, if it gets support, we will give some seed funding. So it's all about staging investment in relation to the value it has. Um, at, at, this, at, the, at the, let's say, embryonic stage, we'll give a little bit of money to explore it further, get it to the next stage, explore it further, give more money until we would invest more money into it. So this is this Opal platform, some of you might know. It's, um, it's a tool available. Uh, we have developed it or in coordination with Opal for our own users. And that's just probably a screenshot from this morning. Um, and again, it's open to people. We just have one new trial about designing a better water butt um, with some selected people, so a pre-selection of people joining into that. Um, and this is just something what Cuts up. So for the brainstorming, for the very first phase, harvesting ideas, it's a great platform. Um, there's a lot of interactivity, it's fun, it's exciting. And then uh, you need to actually go to the next stage of the project and you will reshape your team probably. And you will do have a different uh, notion of management within your team members to be able to go all the way through to design a better water butt, which has a value, which is not just a technical value, but also value for, for um, in terms of sustainability or, or environment. So this is probably um, well, the story. Can we handle a question here? Okay, shall I just shall give a little summary? Because then I'm yeah, done. sure, sure. Then we yeah. Um, so I think you know, getting here together is the first thing of making something happen. Uh, so great. Um, and 
again, I think if we team up uh, on the first phase, it's very rich. And, and the, the problem often is how to keep that team together, or maybe really you can't. You need to think about who else to get to get to the next level. And, and that are really difficult decisions. And they are requiring, I think, a new type of leadership. 20 years ago, uh, ago we called it management. And now I think we call it leadership. But leadership is something which goes beyond that, is, is getting the purpose right, getting people's input, and showing the direction where we want to go, and then leave the freedom of those people to achieve that goal, and maybe call them back if they're going to the wrong direction. But this is something we're exploring, so we see how it's going to happen, and I'm quite excited about it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I first go to the lady uh, for a question, if you don't mind. Thanks. Well, thanks for the presentation. I, I have a very general question, which is related to the project you showed. Uh, in most of the sustainable and technology buildings, we see that uh, the facades and the output of the building is not, uh, from the aesthetic point of view, well designed. And uh, most of the time it contains very exaggerated elements to show the technology, which doesn't make the building really lovely. And I was wondering, how are you managing this? Because uh, also in the project, I, I feel the same. How are you managing to solve this problem? Uh, don't you think that you, uh, like there is a need of mu more multidisciplinary approach to the projects like this? Thanks. I love the word my disciplinary. I mean, I would call it interdisciplinary. I think the more silos we can break down between disciplines, the better it is. Absolutely. And in that case, you know, probably the design would look different with an architect on board. In that case of the project, it was the matter whether you can take the opportunity to develop the system. And at that point, there, there was no architect anymore. Um, and maybe we should have pulled in a designer, but you have a number of priorities to work through. And I have to admit, at that point, the priority was to deliver a system which works in, in a certain time frame. So for the first step, I think, showing this is not the end product. It's, it's, it's something showing that it's possible. And we hope that, of course, architects like you, other people, will pick it up and design something more beautiful around it. Um, and what this is, I think, is more a platform, again. We developed a system which closes the loop of energy generation, water, food, carbon, and the first time, I think, linking the biological and the technical cycle. It's not the end development. It's, it's a start, but it's the first push of a boundary. So what we hope, of course, is to, get, to open up and get more people into the, into the box. Box is a horrible word, but in, in, on, on board, let's say. Um, and interdisciplinary work, absolutely. I mean, it's all about that. But, but you need the right people in that team to manage that. And there's a lot of talk about T-shape and I-shape. You do need an element of T-shape to get those people together to integrate. But that shouldn't mean that your technical depth goes um, smaller and that you make compromises. Um, so that was a challenge on that project as well. A short question. Um, I could not find your clients on the platform. You know, with a slogan, let's say, wisdom of the crowds. Or do you have integrated your clients in the platform? Do it's they are allowed question, to make proposals? It's a very good question. And there is, there is a danger, of course, that you do navel gazing. That you look at what you can do and, oh, this is great, let's do it. But there's no real uh, requirement or no client need for it. And what we did with those six, um, six themes, we had workshops between the business leaders with clients to harvest what their priority is, what their need is. And those needs were going back into the research roadmap. So in that way, the client is present by setting the priorities. And if we would go later to the venture stage, um, while we have harvested idea, we would play it back to the client again. But there, for, the f for that first development stage, it's an internal process. to the um, to the strategy used to uh, for, for the internal funding so that everyone can actually apply for, for a project to be funded how's the evaluation taking place exactly because um, you have the you have the six uh, streams of, of uh, that, that you want to follow 
these are defined, uh, what we heard now, through, uh, through collaborations, brainstorms, and, and uh, also the client can have a word in it. And um, is there, what, what does the um, um, evaluation look like? Is there a certain percentage that you put into longer term, like just a bet on huh. um, this, this could be something that, uh, that we don't know yet if it's interesting? Because the themes are something that, that you know, these are the things we focus on at this moment. But is there, is there also a percentage that, uh, that you say, we have no idea if that will lead somewhere, but uh, maybe that could be really innovative? Thank you, it's a good question. We, have, we uh, do have three categories. I think maybe I think I saw something similar in your presentation, Caroline. Is now, new, and next. So what's generated now is something we would probably not fund. Um, and it would something that sits, I mentioned the word before, skills network, which is a pool of people which work in the same field across offices, regions. And there are skill network managers which have some money, and they would probably fund new or something which is relevant now. So as, a, as the research portfolio holders, uh, we are interested in the, probably in the, in the new and the next. And for us as an engineering company, we are not a university. Um, we don't do you know, groundbreaking basic science. We, d we are application focused. And for our clients and for, for the people inside the company, it's, it's important to have something in two or three years. So I think three years is probably the time frame that um, will define whether we see there is some, some benefit within three years. Um, and then there is next, which is the really the big picture stuff, um, the, bl the blue ocean. And there is um, some funding from a group which is called Foresight and Innovation, which will also invest in that field. So the research is what we call the new stuff. Um, and that's time frame of three years, I would think. And the evaluation, sorry, I didn't mention that. So um, there are, again, there is a guy in the middle of the network, really working through, pushing in the right direction. And then he's got his teams, again, together from the different skills network, commenting on it. And if we have approval from different of the specialists, the funding gets. So also the approval process is an open platform, really. You, 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 what puzzles me is that I worked a bit with architects once in a while, and very often they have an ego. Yeah? And very often this ego is in the way of a very open collaboration. And you, 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 the way you talk, I think, wow, that's great. You know, you, it's only about competences. You make a team and it works. Very often, in my experience, and I might be part of the problem here, it doesn't work like that. What is your reflection on that? I mean, the project I showed had lots of problems with egos. Yeah. The, the alga? The oh alga? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's part of the thing. And you won't overcome that if you don't really define the common purpose. And I think, of course, it, you get them on board if you do fundamentally design a corporation contract, which sets out a financial aim for everyone and to set really clearly that um, there are elements you need from everyone to be successful. And then you can overcome the ego. Mm -hmm. And at the end, of course, opening, everyone stands up in front of the camera and gets the publicity. So in the end, it works. The egos have their platform. If we end now, we're right on time and we didn't blast our ego. Uh, Mr. Jan Worm, thank you very much. Thank you. Um.